Okay, you can turn in your Bible this morning to Luke chapter 8. Today's subject is going to be on spiritual blindness. And you're going to see how spiritual blindness relates to physical blindness. And of course, I'm not you know, trying to cut down anybody that is blind, born blind, or blind as a result of an accident or sickness or something. But I'm going to show you that in Scripture there are uh, reasons why people cannot see the truths of Scripture, cannot see why the condition of the world is headed towards destruction. There are reasons for that. But this is a very interesting thing here in Luke chapter 8. We're going to begin at verse 4. It says here, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now that's a very interesting thing there. You have these multitudes coming to Jesus. There's huge crowds of people. What were they coming for? The majority of them. To see the show. To see the show. The majority of those people were not there to be taught the word. Okay, the majority of those people were seeing the miracles. That's what they wanted to come and see. And so Jesus Christ spoke to them in parables. And then he says, if you have ears to hear, listen. You know, basically. Verse 9, And his disciples asked him, saying, What, what might this parable be? They're confused. They're like, What's it talking about a seed and a sower? Huh? Are we, you know, are we supposed to do gardening or something here? I mean, And you'll see that if you read through the Gospels all the time. Jesus speaks to them in a parable and they'll be like, Oh, we don't have enough meat. And he's like, No, 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 no. Are you yet without understanding? You know. Why did Jesus speak in parables? Look at verse 10. And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Hmm. You see, if somebody comes to the Lord with a skeptical, critical heart, and they're just kind of like of unbelief, and you know, they, they just kind of want to be there for the show, and they want to see, show us signs. What did Jesus say about signs? An adulterous and, and wicked generation seeketh after a sign. That's what these people were doing. And so he says, I'm going to explain it to you guys. And of course, you read the next couple of verses. We're not going to do it, but you read it. And he goes in and he explains that it's talking about preaching the word. And a lot of people don't receive it. And the only ones that do are the ones that falls on good ground and they receive it. And there's fruit that's born. But the point is, he explained it to them because they were there to learn. And there were probably people within the crowd that probably were able to get what Jesus Christ was saying. See, there's a spiritual requirement there to be able to, to understand and see what's going on in this world. You have to have a desire to please God, to, to want to know God. You know, the Bible talks about having to search the Scriptures and having to Look for wisdom and truth. Okay, not go along with the flow of the world. Somebody who is compromising and and trying to fit in with the world, they're never going to be able to, to serve the Lord, and most of them will never get saved. You know? You cannot be conformed to the world. Now, the key to this sermon today is understanding something, and that is that two people can look at the same thing and come up with two different uh, reactions to that. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, I'll give you a couple examples. I'll speak in a parable. How about a car wreck? Now, two people look at that in different ways. To the owner of the car that just wrecked, you know, the car will say it's a wife, you know, and she wrecks her husband's car or something, you know. We'll use that as an example. She backs into another vehicle. The husband looks and he goes, oh, man, this is going to cost me a lot of money. What about the uh, body shop guy? He looks at it as it, it. He looks at it as this is a good thing, you know. That's his business. So those two people looked at the same thing and came up with two different reactions. 
How about a peaceful day? Well, good people, the average person looks and they say, oh, nothing bad happened today. That's a good thing. What about the news media? Well, there's nothing to report on. You know what the news media wants? They want blood. They want gore. They want natural disasters. They get all excited about that. I remember the one time, you know, it cracked me up. There was a sight and sound, the big theater, and they had a fire. They had a big fire, you know, and all these, you know, fire companies from all over the county were going to the thing. And I heard about it. I was at work. It was lunch break. And I said to my boss, I'm like, my brother's working there. Can, you know, is it okay if I go or make sure he's okay? And he's like, yeah, go ahead. You know, you know we'll, we'll hear about when you get back or whatever. So me and a guy that I worked with, we hopped in my truck and took off and we got there. And it was so funny because we got there about the same time that the news crews got there. And you should have seen these news reporters. You talk about a bunch of hams, you know. And they, I mean, they're, they're like yelling at their camera guy. Get over here. Come on. Hurry. Hurry. We got to get this report out. Come on. Come on. You know, and they're like, you know, yelling at people and stuff and get out of the way. Get out of the way of the camera. And it's like, okay. Are we rolling? Okay. We're here at the scene of the crime, you know, and the, or see here at the, at the fire, and you can see behind us here, sight and sound, da, 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 da. Okay. and I'm like, you, you career-minded, you know, and and you know what would have happened if there would have been an accident or something, and it'd be blood, they'd be like, oh, oh, oh. They, they'd get all excited. See, two different people come to two different reactions over a same event. We would look at a peaceful day as something good. News media looks at it as something bad. You know, again, you see the thing there. People can come to different reactions. Here's a real good one. How about the cross of Jesus Christ? A sinner that's desperate, that knows I can't save myself. I need some other way into heaven. You know, they look at the cross as a good thing. Because Jesus Christ paid it all. I don't have to do anything but accept his death on the cross to get into heaven. That's a good thing. How about somebody who's self-righteous? It's a bad thing. They don't want to have to think about God's son dying in agony on the cross. This Jew, a homeless carpenter Jew there, dying in agony up there on a cross, stripped naked and beat to where you can't even recognize that he's a man anymore. They don't want to think about that. I'm a good person. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not so bad. I mean, I've never killed anybody and... You know, I'm not like Hitler, you know, the old thing there. See, two different people look at the same thing in a different way. Okay, and, and of course you have somebody who's blind and somebody who can see. They're also going to come to different reactions, different conclusions, if you will. And we're going to look today at some scriptures here that talk about why you have these lost people. And it's like you hear them in, in, like over the condition of the world and it's like, don't you get it? <laughs> Don't you understand where this world's headed? I mean, are you yet without understanding? So we're going to look at that today. It's an interesting subject. Now, why can't the lost world see and understand the Word of God? And by the way, that's you know the correct way. I'm not just talking looking at it like this. They can do that. You can see the Word of God in the world. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, the love of money. You can demonstrate that in thousands of ways. You know, the Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You can demonstrate that in thousands of ways. This book is scientific, real, true science, testable, demonstrable and observable. There are so many things in the Bible that you can show readily all throughout the world. And yet people say the Bible's not relevant for today. Oh, yes, it is. It's very relevant, but they can't understand it and they can't see the application of Scripture. Why is that? Turn to John, the book of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14, verse 15. And this is a real difficult thing for a lot of the modern professing Christians out there to accept. But this is what... Jesus Christ said, you know, they claim to be lovers of Jesus. Well, here you go. John chapter 14, verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. 
You mean when you get saved, the Holy Spirit sticks with you forever? Hmm. You mean you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise forever? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you don't lose the Holy Spirit and have to pray and get saved again and you get Him back and for a little while until you sin again and you lose Him. And Yeah. There are so many verses of Scripture that you can use for eternal security for a Christian in, the, in this church age where we're at. There are so many verses that you can use. Don't fall for this thing and you can lose your salvation. little side note there. But anyhow, uh, verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth... Now, of course, when you see the word even, it's saying the comforter, even the spirit of truth. It's one and the same. Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Now, if you don't see something, what is that? Blindness. Spiritual blindness. You know, and what's one of the favorite things that the lost world does? I can't see God. You know, and it's funny because actually in the book of Revelation, I've been over this before, when they actually do see God, the mystery of God is, is finished and they actually, the whole world can see God, they still don't repent. So don't give me the saying, oh, if I could just see God, I'd believe. No, they wouldn't. What a lie. Why? Well, they're spiritually blind. Uh, Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you, the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, it wasn't Judas Iscariot. He wouldn't come up with something spiritual like this because he was a devil. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? See the, the, the carnal thing there? He's saying, well, if we can see you, you know, wouldn't everybody else be able to see you? You know, wouldn't everybody else be able to understand? And look at what Jesus says. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words lowercase w, written words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You want to be in the will of God, you better know your Bible. Just as simple as that. Okay, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2. And again, you know, in this study, there's a lot of these scriptures we hit here all the time. But it's just another reminder. You know, that's that's the thing of being a Christian. This, the Bible's not a book that you read once and then, you know, I read, I read that book, you know, ten years ago and I don't need to read it anymore. No. You need to constantly be renewing your mind. Mm -hmm. You need to read the Bible every day. You know, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. <laughs> little kid's song. Yep, a lot of truth in it. You know, a lot of these big seminary professors and big preachers and things should go back and listen to the kids' song. You know, Jesus loves me, this I know, know for the Bible tells me so. They stand up in the pulpits and they preach out of books that they don't believe in. Anyhow, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Hmm. I hath not seen? What did we just read? These people, they, they can't see it. The world cannot see. Okay? I hath not seen. Look at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. The Comforter, the Spirit of Truth that we just read about back there in John chapter 14. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. See, they have their, a man has his own spirit, you know, and he's, you know, I can understand this stuff, and he tries to figure things out. That's why there's so many cults out there, you know. Look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, 
but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now here's a very important verse, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You go over to the book of Ephesians, and you'll see that man is dead in trespasses and sin. The lost man is dead. He is not capable of understanding the Word of God. And you say, but shouldn't we rewrite the Bible so the lost can understand it? That's one of my favorite justifications for these new versions these, they come up with. I have lost friends and they can't understand the King James Bible. They're not supposed to. A lost person is not supposed to be able to just open up the King James Bible and explain everything, all the doctrine. They're not supposed to understand. I mean, you talk about a, a really dumb defense of the new versions. And it's funny too because I've had people say, my lost friends can't understand the King James, but they can understand the NIV. <laughs> And it's like, yeah. yeah, I know why. Because the NIV is a dead book. It's a dead book written by dead scholars for dead, lost sinners. But a living, live Christian that has the Holy Spirit in them, you aren't going to use the NIV. Okay, there are people that do, but the Holy Spirit will eventually lead them to the true word, the King James Bible. The living word of God. This is a living book. Now, you say, okay, well then... He that's spiritual, you know, uh, the verse 15 there, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Okay, then, then a, a saved person can understand the entire Bible and never make any mistakes. Right? We can have perfect understanding of Scripture. Right? Wrong. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. See, what's this have to do with spiritual blindness? Well, we're going to see. You know, there's different levels of blindness. There are some people that are blind in one eye, but they can see fine out of the other eye. There's some people that are that are almost blind, and they need... What do you need when you're almost blind? Glasses. Corrective lenses. You know? I mean, if, I, if we walk out here to one of these fields and I say, there's a, over a, 1,200 yards away there, there's a, a deer standing. Can you tell me how many points he has on his antlers well they're not up yet but you know the point is well you'd say oh, i can't see that far i can't see out that far ahead what do you need you need some kind of binoculars or scope or whatever you know you need some kind of a way to fix your vision to make up for the the loss that you have there keep that in mind first corinthians chapter 13 we're going to look at verse 9 says here, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Just in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, a lot of people get confused over this, and I have people ask me this all the time. What is this talking about? Is this talking about the completion of Scripture? Or is this talking about Jesus Christ coming? It's talking about Jesus Christ coming. Because you look up at verse 8, it says, uh, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, when the scripture was completed, it didn't, you know, knowledge didn't vanish away. But see, our earthly knowledge that we have right now is going to vanish away at the rapture. You're not going to get to heaven and have Baptists living in this section and Methodists over there and Presbyterians over there and, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, -uh. We're all going to think the way that Jesus Christ thinks. We're going to see things as he sees them. We'll see that here. Verse 11. When I was a child, that's what you are right now, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Okay, right now, spiritually, what are we? We are sons and daughters of God. We are God's children. When we become men is when we go to be with the Lord. We become a man in our, in our understanding. Look at verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now by faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is the right word there. Listen to our sermon on that. 
charity versus love. Okay, but uh, very interesting there, verse twelve. We for now we see through a glass darkly. Okay, what is the glass? You say, well, you know, that could be interpreted different ways. Well, I'm going to show you. What, what did we read earlier? You compare spiritual things with things spiritual. So, you look up Scripture, you say, okay, glass. What are references to glass? Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. And you're going to see so many tie-ins with the Scriptures that we've previously read. I mean, the, the Bible is just such an amazing book. I mean, it's just this part ties into this verse and that verse into this verse. And I mean, it just it's just like a, like a beautiful tapestry that's all woven together. And the threads just intermingle and just go all together. I mean, the, the King James Bible is an amazing book. Um, James chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Jesus said, if a man keep my words, hmm. And he doesn't mean keep as in I'll keep a, ten copies in my room in a locked container or something. That's not what he means by keep. He means you do it. You abide in Scripture. You are a law-abiding Christian. <laughs> you know, That's what you're supposed to do. You are to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. You know, there's a lot of Christians that go to churches and they hear the word and they say, well, I put in my time for the week and then they go live how they want to live when they're not in church, you know, <laughs> not realizing that the word church in the Bible is talking about the body of Christ, not a building. You're not supposed to have two lives. OK, you're to be a Christian in church all the time. A lot of confusion on that. But continuing here, verse 23 for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Hmm. What do you do when you get up in the morning? and you're getting dressed and everything, you go find a mirror. Why? To examine yourself. What should you do spiritually when you get up in the morning? Go find a mirror and examine yourself. Go find a glass. And you say, but uh, so then we'll just be able to understand the whole thing. No. Now we see through a glass darkly. The Word of God is the glass. This is the mirror that reflects back your true self <laughs> again that's why a lot of self-righteous people don't come to this book you know if you removed all the verses on sin and all the verses on judgment and things like that people would accept creation if god just didn't judge their sins the bible would be accepted by all the people in the world but you see this book condemns sin this book says sodomites are an abomination to the lord Ooh, that offends some people how about people that bow down and worship images like the Catholics? Well, there goes another group. How about people like the Muslims that want to have multiple wives and young girls and stuff like that? Oh, there goes another group. See, this book is offensive. Okay? It's holy. And there's, it's holy. Yeah. yeah, it's holy. That's why it is offensive. You know? This book offends people. That's why it's hated so bad. You know? You see, because people like to go around and say, you know, like the, what was the, the king... Uh, what was the one that they told him that he had a beautiful garment and he was walking around naked or whatever? That that little children's yeah, story um, was it wasn't the King Midas. It was uh, that was kind of the emperor, didn't they call him? The emperor who had no clothes, I think, is what it was. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was convinced that he had the most beautiful garment on and he had nothing on. You know, what was his problem? He should have looked in the mirror. And there are a lot of people who are going around clothed in the, the rags of their own self-righteousness and they don't want to look in the mirror. They don't want to be told, hey, you're dirty, you're filthy, you're on your way to hell. The average person cannot imagine being tormented for eternity in the lake of fire. 
They can't, they can't fathom it. I'm not that bad of a person. The God of the universe wouldn't do that to me. You know, what's the problem? They don't want to look in the mirror. They can't stand it. Yep. And what's the, the key to it? Pride. Yeah. But uh, let's go on to the next verse here. Now, why is the lost world spiritually blind? What's the main problem? Well, I just kind of talked about it. Because of sin. Turn in your Bible to Isaiah. Back to your Old Testament. The book of Isaiah, chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. And this is actually where you have a, a situation where people will cross the line with the Lord and the Lord will say, okay, you want to sin? You want to live like that? I'm going to give you blindness. See, it's not all just of their own, their own doing and that they say, I don't want to hear it. There are times when a nation will get so wicked that God will say, you're not going to understand my word. You're going to be punished. I'm going to judge you. And I'm actually going to keep the truth from you. Because you've crossed the line with me. You know, and there's a lot of people here in this country that I would say they've crossed the line with the Lord. Mm -hmm. could, you, could they still get saved or something? Well, it's going to be almost impossible. You get somebody who's a man that's, that's gone through surgery to change himself into a woman... Can they still get saved? Uh, boy. I would say no. Unless some kind of super duper miracle or something. But you can, you can get to a point. And there are sodomites that have gotten saved, but they've repented of it. Mm -hmm. They change. They turn from their sin. Okay? And a sodomite that says, I'm just going to continue being a sodomite, but I'm going to go to a sodomite church. No, no, no. No. Sorry. That doesn't work. You can't do something that God says is an abomination and continue in that lifestyle and be saved. It's not going to happen. But anyhow, let's look here. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. And again, keep your eyes out for the thing. Keep, you know, keep your eyes out. Look for the thing that talks about spiritual blindness. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Okay, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So in other words, it's not that the Lord's saying, you cannot possibly get saved, I will not possibly forgive you, there in verse 1, but your iniquities, it's gotten so bad, it's to the point now where he's saying, okay, I have to punish. I can't just turn around and say, no, you know, forget about it. Why? Well, look at verse 3. For your hands have defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies, they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and, which, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper." Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths, whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace." Hmm. There's no peace to the wicked, saith my God. Okay? The God of peace is what you need. And that comes from judgment. Self-judgment. Looking into the mirror. Okay? Verse 9. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We walk, or we wait for light, but behold, obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind and we grope as if we had no eyes we stumble at noonday as in the night we are in desolate places as dead men hmm isn't that interesting now you need to notice a couple things there 
number one, these people weren't innocent. They couldn't say, well, how, you know, who is God to judge us? No, they were living in sin. God had to judge them. But it says there in verses 9 and 10 that they were looking for light. Kind of interesting because you have people today and they say, oh, this is so illuminating. Hmm. Or, you know, the Masons. What is it that you most desire? Enter an apprentice. Light. Master Mason, more light. You know, and yet they're in darkness. How many people think that they, you know, oh, things just make so much sense now, and blah, 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 and they're in darkness. They don't know what they're doing. They're not saved. You know, very interesting. But what is the characteristic of somebody there in verse 10? We grope for the wall like the blind. What is it when you grope? You feel your own, what, what is this here? This is a, what's this back here? All, it feels like a, maybe a window. Oh, there's a hinge. What are you doing? You are feeling. Hmm. How many times have you been told, don't judge me, I feel that I'm right? What are you dealing with? You're dealing with somebody who's spiritually blind. Okay? Hey, you want to talk to me about something and judge me? Do it with Scripture. Don't come to me and say, I, I feel that you're not right. I don't care about your feelings. I care about Scripture. When I'm wrong, you correct me with Scripture. And when you're wrong, I have to correct you with Scripture. And not just say, you know, I just feel that there are some problems here. Feelings what blind people do. And again, you know, if you're blind and you're listening to this, I'm not at all making fun or anything. We're talking about spiritually blind people. And yet that's exactly what the majority of people do. What's the, the modern day saying? If it feels good, do it. Hmm. Well, you know, I bet the ground feels mighty good walking up to a cliff. And you aren't going to notice all of a sudden, you know, you don't feel like, oh, there's something that feels like I'm walking towards a cliff. You don't feel anything like that. You know? I'm going to talk about this a little bit as we continue here, but we were up at uh, Northern PA this, this the last couple of weeks here, my wife and I, and or last couple of days, excuse me, not weeks, last couple of days, and we went up to these vistas, you know, way up on top of the mountains, and it just drops off hundreds of feet, you know. It feels fine. You'd be going along feeling all oh, the trees and the bushes and everything else, and all of a sudden, drops off. And you wouldn't know it, just feeling your way. If somebody blindfolded you, you'd go right over the edge. There's no way to tell that you're getting to the edge of the cliff. Okay, what do you need? You need a glass, glasses, be able to see spiritually, you know, well, physically for that, but you need to be able to see. You could not rely on, you know, I would not walk around those places in, in the dark of night. There is no way. I mean, you talk about scary. That'd be a nightmare, you know. You need to be able to see. Now, turn to Zephaniah chapter 1. We're going to see another place here where God judges. You know, the Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish and all that. You know, we're going to see that later. But uh, there's a limit to His mercy, to His long-suffering, to His patience. You know, you can't expect Him to just put up with everything. Zephaniah, back there in your Minor Prophets. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 17 Yeah, if that it's, it's to the right of Habakkuk. Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah, right, right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. These the minor prophets are some of the roughest books I think with most people, and and there's a lot of stuff in them that you know you just kind of go, what? <laughs> you know, well, why? Well, because we see through a glass darkly. A lot of this stuff is written for Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, and also into the millennium. You see a lot of that stuff, and it's just like I don't understand a lot of it. You get into the book of Zechariah, and there's stuff in there that I just kind of go, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> you know, I see through a glass darkly. But anyhow, let's look at this verse here. Uh, verse 17, Zephaniah 1, 17. And I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, 
because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Let me ask you a question. What good would gold and silver do if I took you up there to northern PA at the cliff there and blindfolded you and said walk around a little bit? Nothing. Your gold and silver, you could have pockets full of gold and silver and it wouldn't do a thing to help with your eyesight. And spiritually speaking, if you are spiritually blind, your gold and silver that you're saving up for the end times and whatever, some of these you know people that, that are lost and you know the patriot types, they're all saving up, you know, I'm going to make it, I'm going to come out at the end of this thing, we're going to enter into a new restored republic here in America and all this stuff. No, you're not. You read through the book of, of Revelation and look at some of the things, the plagues that come. What good is gold and silver going to do when all the water is blood? When there's war all over the earth? You're going to actually be a target at that point in time. What you better do is you better get right with God. All your money, all your bank accounts, all your safety nets that you have, you know, life insurance policies, they're going to mean nothing. Okay, it's, isn't it funny that there's a lot of people out there that'll say, I have a big life insurance policy in case something goes wrong, and yet they're not saved? Isn't that weird? Hey, you know what the most important life insurance policy is? Salvation through Jesus Christ. That's life insurance. Not something that you get from some crooked agency out there that you give your money to, and if things fall apart, they'll take your money and run. <laughs> you know? Give me a break. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now we're going to go back almost to the beginning of the Bible. Show you a couple, show you a couple more interesting verses here. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 28. It's kind of funny because, you know, there's a, another saying. You know, something happens to somebody and they say... Boy, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> you know? And it's kind of like the Lord's kind of like, all right, you people, you don't believe in me, do you? Okay, I'll show you some proof. These atheists out there, you know, show me proof that your God exists, you know. I had a, a guy say the, the big fairy wizard in the sky. Mm-hmm. You know. You're going to eat those words someday, buddy. You know, oh, show me, show me proof that your fairy tale God exists. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you blindness right now. And when you actually get to see me, you're going to be one of the ones that's running for cover. Screaming and running, hiding in the rocks, you know, and praying that the rocks fall on you to hide you from the face of the lamp. I mean, this stuff. Anyhow, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 28. It says here, the Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness. And astonishment of heart, and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Hmm. You mean, not only is this a prophecy of the last times, the end times, but it was actually given as a warning back, the whole way back in the book of Deuteronomy? Yeah. God has always dealt with man and said, this is the way I want you to live. Here it is. Do it this way. Oh, don't tell me what to do. And the Lord says, okay. You're going to be blind. Spiritual blindness. And I don't have this verse listed, but there's a time in the book of Acts where this guy comes and, and, he, and he says, uh, you know, he's, he's resisting the preaching there. I think it was Peter. And I forget, but he was like a sorcerer or something like that, and he was bewitching people. Mm-hmm. And Peter rebukes him, and what happens? He goes blind. What happened to Paul when he was Saul on the road to Damascus, out there killing Christians in Acts chapter 9? What happened? The Lord spoke to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What happened to Saul? When he got out of the being talked to by the Lord, he went blind. Yeah. And for a couple days there, he was blind. Very interesting. 
It's a sign of judgment upon a nation when people are blind spiritually. Now turn to Job chapter 5. I mean, this this book is so amazing. I'll tell you what, you know, just going through it and, and as with any study you do, it just, you start hitting these verses and you start getting into the scriptures and, it, and I mean, there's so many verses that you could use, you know, when you're doing a study. I mean, just it just ties all together. It's an amazing book. Job chapter 5, verse 13. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope in the noonday as in the night. Hmm. Even when it's bright out and everything and, and people should see. I mean, it just cracks me up. The Bible says there would be earthquakes in diverse places. And the U.S. Geological Survey has actually revamped some of their earthquake data because it shows that earthquakes are increasing every year. There's more and more earthquakes. The earthquakes are getting worse and worse and, and more and more rapid and, and frequent. And they say, oh, I just don't think that that's you know, the same as what Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24. You know, there shall be wars and rumors of wars. Do we have that today? The 20th century was the most war-torn century in human history. More people were killed as a result of war in the 20th century than ever before in all of recorded history. And yet people go, I just don't think the Bible's true. I just don't see any proof. <laughs> What's wrong? They're spiritually blind. And it's interesting, you can compare this, I'm not, I don't have this uh, written down, but you can compare this to the 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2 where it talks about God taking the wise in their own craftiness. Mm -hmm. And it's right there. Verse 13 in Job chapter 5, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Just amazing. These people go off to their colleges and stuff like that, and they come out, oh, you know, I'm an, I'm an evolutionist and everything. You know, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute or two here too. But they come out and they convince themselves, they go through their education to convince themselves that the Bible's not true. That's what it's about. Don't give me this stuff, you know, oh, I go to college to, to study evolution. Why? Well, look at the way the college students live. They live in sin, and they don't want to be judged for that sin. They don't want to have people come in. You know, all the time you see this stuff. Well, we should lower the age, you know, of alcohol and stuff like that. They're drinking alcohol. It shouldn't be 21. It should be whatever. You get a bunch of teenagers in there, you know, fornicating, getting drunk, doing drugs and stuff. They don't want somebody judging their sin. That's why they're there, to convince themselves that God does not exist. And you say, well then you're saying that there are people that are willingly ignorant. Well, that's what the Bible says. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. And it's so funny to me because so many people, it's like, you know, they just thought of it for the first time ever, you know. Some of these theories and stuff, you know, like I, I can prove God's, you know, doesn't exist because such and such or whatever. And it's like I just keep coming up with your stupid excuses, you know, to deny the word of God. But look here, Second Peter chapter three, verse three. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Hmm. They're sinning. They don't want to be judged. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They will actually deny science. They'll say, there's always been earthquakes. There's always been wars. There's always been pestilence and famine. Not on the level of today. Well, you know, maybe. But it's, it's, it's just things are going to get better. You know, why are they saying that? Because they're scoffers that walk after their own lusts. Again, they don't want to be judged for their sins. Look at verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant. They are dumb on purpose. <laughs> willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
So God destroyed the world the first time by water. The second time it's going to be by fire. Look at verse 9. You say, that's not very nice of God. Well, look at verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Has, gone, has God been long-suffering with America? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't even understand it. I'm just like, what on earth, you know, what has taken him so long to judge this place? Well, because there's still, excuse me, there's still some people that need to be saved. They need to hear the gospel preached to them. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to praying the sinner's prayer and believing and receiving. I think the word is repentance. To all the brethren out there that are saying there's no repentance connected to salvation. I get so sick and tired of that. And there are so many, you know, good King James Bible believers that are falling for this thing. Mm-hmm. It's absurd. It's repentance. Okay, that's why you come to the Lord for salvation. Because you come to a knowledge of saying, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need a Savior. Okay, that's what the gospel is. The good news of Jesus Christ. Good news for us sinners. You can't be saved until you are a sinner. <clears throat> You can't be found until you know you're lost. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. Romans chapter 1. You want to see the, the steps through which a nation falls apart and gets God's judgment? Romans chapter 1 is the best chapter in the entire Bible, in my opinion, on how a nation, the decline of a nation, the fall of a nation. But we're just going to focus here on verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You say, well, I can't see any proof of God. Look outside. They are clearly seen. There are some things that God will smite people with blindness that they can't understand. Spiritual things. But physical things that prove God's existence... They are clearly seen. Okay? There's no excuse. Being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Even a blind person, you know, we sang a a song this morning by Fanny Crosby, and a lot of her songs will talk about nature, birds and things like that, singing. Even a blind person can can hear, they can smell, they can feel. They still have senses. Somebody who's physically blind can still understand, wow, what a, what an amazing song. What an amazing, you know, I hear the birds and the trees. I can feel the warm breeze on my face. I can feel the sunlight. I can, you know, I can hear the crickets at nighttime. They can still understand that there is nature out there that could not have happened by random chance. And again, you know, our trip to the mountains. I mean, you drive around and it's just like so amazingly beautiful seeing all nature and everything and these mountains and the streams and the fish in the streams and the deer and and everything else. And you say, and this happened by chance? This is all accidental? I mean, you talk about, excuse me, but a a retarded system of belief. You know, it's, it's absurd to say that everything happened by chance. It's clearly seen. Nobody's going to be able to get up there to heaven and say, I didn't see any proof of you, God. That's why I didn't get saved. No. If you are alive on this earth, you have proof that God exists. Being under the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. You have no excuse. Don't be willingly ignorant. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 7. Here you have a whole group of people that are blind. Romans chapter 11, verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, those that are saved, and the rest were blinded. Alright, getting back to the verse here. Apparently the Lord was listening to the sermon and just had a very rare bird fly up into one of the trees outside there, so we had to take a little break and enjoy God's creation. A scarlet, 
A scarlet tanager. Yes, we were not blind. We were able to see a bird. Wow, amazing. Anyhow, you have here, the nation of Israel did not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Okay? There were some that did. And those are the election. They weren't elected before salvation, by the way. They were elected because of salvation. And those ones were able to see that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. But the rest of the nation of Israel, nationally, they rejected Jesus Christ. And so God said, okay, you want to reject me? Then I'll give you a spirit of blindness. You will not be able to see things and understand things. Let's continue here. Verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. What did Jesus say to the multitudes? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Scripture with Scripture, that's how you interpret the Bible. It all ties together, believe me. It's amazing. Uh, verse 9. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, like we read all throughout the Old Testament, that they may not see, and bow down their back always. You know, the Jews have been subservient to a lot of people down through the years. You know, we have no king but Caesar. <laughs> okay, then Caesar will rule over you. Just like Pharaoh ruled over them before. You know, they just have a hard time learning. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? You know, there's a lot of people out there with, with uh, replacement theology and some even the, some levels of dominion theology and whatever that teach that the church is Israel. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. We are, you know, I understand that there's neither Jew nor Greek and bond nor free and all that stuff, man or female. We're all one in Christ. I understand that. I understand we're supposed to be Christians now, but there's still a distinction there. Not in this dispensation, not for this dispensation. Israel's not going to be restored in the church age. Israel will be, will be restored after the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's when their fullness is going to come in. And what is the fullness of Israel? Jesus Christ as the king ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, it will be the city of the great king, the capital of the whole world. Right now, Jerusalem is just kind of like this pesky place over there. They're always fighting. And people are just like, you know, where would you want to go on vacation? I want to go to Paris. I want to go to, you know, London or to the Bahamas or the Bermuda or someplace. Not too many people want to go to Jerusalem. But they will in the Millennial Kingdom. In fact, they're going to be required to go up from year to year to worship Jesus Christ in the Millennial Kingdom. Why? Because that's when the fullness comes in. That's when all the things, all the promises that God made to Abraham, they're all going to come to pass. They're going to get their land grant, which is huge. It's not just a little thing that they have over there right now. God is not done with, with the nation of Israel. And a lot of problems here you know, come from people trying to spiritualize these passages and make it into the church, the Gentile church. But you just saw there, verse uh, 11 and 12, it talks about the Gentiles. Now, if the Gentiles replaced Israel, how can you have that? How can you work that out? It's clearly making, Paul's making a distinction between Gentiles and Jews. But let's continue here. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Let me just stop there for a minute. Who's this book written to? Romans. Romans. Are Romans Jews? No. They are Gentiles. Okay? So he's saying, brethren. He's writing to Romans. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. There are still some that can get saved. Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Millennial Kingdom. 
Verse 27, For this is my covenant unto them, that when I shall take away their sins. Okay, that's an important thing to remember there. Look at verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Okay? God's not done with the Jews as a people. And I said Jews as in Israelites, not black people that say that they are the true seed of Israel, that you're, you know, we worship Yeshua and all this, this ridiculous movement, and all these other people that try to do it, you know, mm -hmm. that try to take steal the promises from Israel. You know, it's to Abraham and to his seed, the covenant that God made with Abraham. I mean, trace it down through the Bible. It's, it's so absurd. You know, these people, you go, you know, Africa and it goes back to Ham and they say, oh, actually, we're the Jews. Ridiculous. Or Japheth. It's just as ridiculous. But that's a whole other study. Now, Jesus spoke with parables. That seeing they might not see, hearing they might not hear. Are we supposed to do that today? Look at Second Corinthians chapter three. Second <clears throat> Corinthians chapter three, verse twelve. You see, the Jews. One of the reasons why Jesus Christ was doing what he did is because the Jews were. The Jews require a sign. Okay? The Greeks seek after wisdom. Okay? The Jews as a nation rejected Jesus Christ, even though he showed them signs, plenty of signs, you know, he's raised the dead and healed the sick, you know, cleansed the lepers, cast out devil, devils and all that stuff. There was no reason why they shouldn't have accepted him. Even after he, you know, died on the cross and was resurrected, he had the, the 12 apostles go out and they were doing all kinds of signs and wonders. He gave them plenty of chances. They rejected, so he said, okay, the millennial king, kingdom is going to be put off for a while. But now you have the gospel being taken mostly to the Gentile people. So what changes? Well, you'll see some change here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope in Jesus Christ, we use great plainness of speech. When you witness to people, you don't have to use parables anymore. Just come right out and say, look, the Bible says you are a sinner. You qualify to be a sinner. Nobody can say that they're not a sinner. You know, there's none righteous. No, not one. Jesus Christ is your only hope. Use great plainness of speech. Don't overcomplicate the gospel. Okay? Convince them that they're sinners. That's repentance. And then tell them that Jesus Christ saves. There's your salvation. Verse 13 uh, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. The Old Testament law. But their minds were blinded, for unto this, until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away, now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hmm. You mean we can understand not only salvation, but where this world is headed? Because we have the Word of God? Yep. As I said earlier, if I try to show you something that's 1,200 yards away or really far away, you're not going to be able to see it unless you have binoculars. You know, when, when we were up there in the mountains, you know, they had this lookout tower on one of the ridges, you know, that they could see from their front porch, but you couldn't make out the details. I mean, it was just like, is that a tree sticking up or whatever? They hand you binoculars, a glass, and they say, now look. And you look through the glass and you go, Oh, I can see way out there. You know? I can't tell you everything that's going to happen in the future. I'm not able to do that. We prophesy in part. Okay? I can't I can't say every little thing. I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow at 6 a.m. in the morning. You know, Central Standard Time or something like that. I, I can't do that. But I can prophesy in part and say things are going to get worse. 
there's going to be more earthquakes, there's going to be more wars, there's going to be more disease, more pestilence, more, more famine, more things like that. Why? Because I have a glass. I have the Word of God. And I can prophesy through that. I'm not spiritually blind. I'm not walking around at noonday going, what, you know, I've got to feel my way here. What is this? What? I don't know what that is. I'm not doing that. A Christian should be able to tell what the future is. And I get so sick and tired of hearing Christians that will go, I think we're coming out of the economic problem here in America. <laughs> you know, um, there has never been a nation that has been in more debt than America. Never in the history of the world has a nation been in debt tens of trillions of dollars. I don't even know what it is. You know, the number's changing all the time. I mean, you look at the clock up there, Wall Street or whatever, the big, not clock, but the big sign, and the numbers are just like, just spinning. Our national debt grows hundreds of millions of dollars every couple minutes. But we're going to come out of it? No, we're not. And if a Christian is that, a professing Christian, if they're that blind, what's the problem? They're living in sin. And they're not reading the Word of God. Okay, the, the Word of God is very clear about the future. Now, we're going to hit one more place here in our study. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. And we're going to see here a very clear distinction between the spiritually blind and those that can see. And remember what we said, what we read earlier there. These people grope around in darkness. Even in noonday, they, the, brightness part of, the brightest part of the day, they still are blind. They still grope in darkness. Let's read here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they, now notice the distinction as we go through here, ye, you, yours, ours, versus they. Okay, it's talking about the lost world. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You see, you have people that see the, the condition of the world and everything's falling apart, and they say, I think things are getting better. Peace and safety. We're this close to world peace. You know, I remember there's a picture. You can look it up probably. It's all over the internet, you know, by now. But uh, Bozo, I like to call him Bono from, from the band, the rock band U2. And he had this picture that he's posing for. And he's got a blindfold around his eyes. And underneath it says coexist. And shows all the symbols of the world's religions and things. The major religions, the T, of course, is the cross. You know, the C is like the, the moon and the star of Islam and stuff. And the O is the yin and yang and all stuff. And it's like, doesn't this idiot realize what he's doing? He's saying, I'm blind to the distinctions between us. And he thinks that that makes him spiritual. It's like, you're just admitting to being spiritually blind. You're the one that, that the Bible judges. You know, just amazing. What's he doing? Peace and safety. If we just give up our differences and learn to tolerate one another, then we'll have peace and safety. And it's like the Lord's up there going, sudden destruction's coming, and you're not going to escape. You mean that there's a group that's going to escape the sudden destruction? Mm -hmm. The we. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, the we. <laughs> but look at verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch. How do you watch? By looking with your eyes. Let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night and they that be Drunken are drunken in the night. You know what the best time to go to a bar is? It isn't noonday. It's at night. That's when the majority of them are there. They got the neat little neon signs advertising all the ridiculous forms of alcohol. They light up best at night. 
not during the day. See? You see, it's funny because they look for light in artificial ways, not for the true light of Jesus Christ or the light of the Word of God. Again, we're coming back yesterday in this group of Harleys. They look, you know, they had, the one guy had something like, um, going to hell and proud of it or something like that on the front of his bike, huh. you know, and it flames and tattoos and all black leather and stuff. And I looked and this guy's following my truck and I have, you know, if you die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? You know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. I had that on the back of my truck and a guy was mad and he was, you know, shaking his head back and forth like, this is ridiculous. What's the problem? He's in darkness. Interesting too that he's dressed in darkness, all black leather and everything. You know, very interesting. Doesn't want to see the truth. But let's continue here. Verse 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Compared to Ephesians chapter 6. Um, verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake, alive in Christ, or sleep, the dead in Christ, uh, we should live together with him. There's the rapture. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. The comfort is, it would be rather dismal and horrible if I said to you, looking out into the future, there's all these bad times coming and we're not going to escape. We're going to have to go through it all. That wouldn't be much of a comfort, knowing all these horrible things that are coming on the world. But through the scripture, we prophesy in part, I can see out into the future and I can say, well, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. I'm seeing through the glass darkly, but Jesus is coming soon. As bad as this world is getting, as hopeless as this world is, I can tell you we're going to be getting out at some point in time. And then it's going to get real bad. <laughs> Okay, really, really bad. The worst time period ever in the history of the world. You know? You say, well, how do you know that? How are you sure? Because I have a book. I have a glass here. So, things are going to get rough. The farther down towards this future we get, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Not better. The economy's not coming around. I'm sorry to ruin your day, but it's not coming around. Things are going to get worse. But we have hope and we have comfort knowing that Jesus Christ at some point in time is going to say, okay, that's about enough. I'm getting my kids out. The Bible prophesies it. It's going to happen. So until that day, the thing that you need to do is keep that in the back of your mind that Jesus is coming. Be busy about his work. But also, there's the thing there of, if you look up there in verse 6, therefore let us not sleep as do others. Did you know you can go to sleep as a Christian? Did you know that you can get messed up with the world's sins as a Christian? You know, a lot of people don't understand that. But as I've said before in this in our studies, you are only two-thirds saved. Your spirit is quickened. Your soul is redeemed. Your flesh remains the same. Your flesh is not immortal or perfect or sinless. You can commit the sins of the lost world. Your destination is different, but you can still commit the sins. You can fall asleep if you listen to the wrong people. You can say, well, maybe I think things will get better. You know, we're going to restore the republic. And all this stuff. No, we're not. Nope. I think things are going to get better. The economy's getting better. You know, gas prices went down 20 cents, so we're coming out of it. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not. Sorry, but we're not. And what you need to do as a Christian is you need to examine yourselves in the mirror of God's Word. You need to behold yourself in, as in a glass in here and you need to say, am I a doer of the Word or just a hearer of the Word? It's something to think about. And we all need to do it. You know, I'm not exempt because I'm a pastor. You know, I don't somehow get out of it or something like that. I oversee the flock. That's all I do. You know, I'm not somehow holier than other people. Okay. I have to examine myself. We all do. So that's the challenge for this morning. Do not be spiritually blind. Interpret things through the lens of Scripture. Look out towards the future through what the Word of God says about prophecy. So, 
That's going to be it for this morning. Thank you very much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.